And uh, what this slide shows is the missions that we've had sent to Mars since Mars Global Surveyor. And with that, we've had orbiters and landers. And with each successive mission, we've been able to increase the spectral and spatial resolution of our look at the red planet. And we've learned so much more. We've learned that Mars is a dynamic planet. We've learned that it has a history where it was warm and wet at the same time that life started here on Earth. And we know that it's gone through a massive transition from that more benign planet of early on to what it is today. And so we're actually here to give you a rundown on some of the things that we've learned in the last 10, 15 years about the red planet that encourage us to think that Mars is worth exploring for many different reasons, including the potential of having been habitable at least in its past. George? Thank you, Michael. And now to Bethany Elman, the scientist from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and assistant professor from the California Institute of Technology. Bethany. So, so I have the, the privilege of, of talking to you about some of the, the discoveries from this flotilla of missions that we've sent to Mars over the past decade. And if we can start with the first graphic, I'm gonna, I'm gonna begin the story with what we know about Mars as it is today. So these are, these are the top highlights of what we know about Mars today. And so Mars today on, on this graphic is, is what you see in the top left of this picture. Mars, like Earth, is, is tilted uh, on, on its axis and as it's spinning like a top. So, so Mars has seasons. You can see the two polar ice caps at, at the north and, and south of, of Mars. But Mars, unlike Earth, is not stable around, around its spinning axis. So what happens is that Mars' axis tilts. Okay, and, and, and what we found through a combination of modeling and observations of the surface is that this results in, in ice ages on modern day Mars. You can see that when, when Mars is tilted more extremely than it is today, ice builds up around the equator. When Mars sort of straightens out along its axis, the poles grow in size. So the, this changing distribution of ice is one of the emerging stories that's come out, of, uh, come out of the work of the recent decades. And if we go to the next slide, we see evidence of this. The high-rise camera on the Mars Reconnaissance <coughs> Orbiter is able to examine the surface at very high resolution. And what we've found is that, that impact craters that impact into the mid-latitudes of Mars have fa excavated ice from beneath the surface, and, and that's what you see in this image here, ice associated with these small craters. Now this ice isn't, isn't stable at the surface. It's a relic of these, of these past tilts and changes in Mars's obliquity. And so if we look back at this on the order of a few weeks and a few months, at the same spot, the ice is gone, but, it, but it's a hint at, at, at past climate change. If we head to the next graphic, the other hint of this changing dynamic modern Mars is, is in this recent discovery where you can see from uh, right to left these dark uh, streaks emanating from the walls of a crater. These, uh, these streaks uh, were, were recently, uh, in a recent paper by Alfred McEwen et al., the best hypothesis we have to explain those streaks is that they're formed by uh, short-term discharge of briny waters when, when modern-day Mars heats up during the summer for a brief period in time, this ephemeral quick period of time, we, we may in fact have salty waters on Mars. So if we go to the next graphic, I've talked to you about modern Mars, a story of ice, very, very, very short term rare water. But if we look at ancient Mars, this is a topographic map where red is high elevations, blue is low elevations. We're looking at the Mars globe and I've oriented it so that you can see Mars has these enormous outflow channels and valleys. That, that flow out, uh, where water previously flowed out uh, into the northern lowlands. That's that blue low depression uh, uh, toward the, toward the left-hand side of the screen. So liquid water was not short-term in the past. We, we know that it carved, had a, had, a, had a role in carving out these large channels. And if we head to the next graphic, it also had a role in depositing sediments within craters. Now this is, a, this is a, 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 an image that's a combination of some of the data sets from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, the high resolution camera, the context imager, and then overlaying are, are colors from the, from the CRISM. Uh, infrared spectrometer. And these colors, along with the, the spectra uh, from pixels in this image, allow us to get at the composition of these sedimentary materials that were carried by the water. And now the key, the key uh, color here is the green, because the green uh, materials have been identified as clays and carbonates. Now these 
are minerals that form uh, in the presence of liquid water. And the clays in particular indicate the long-term presence of water interacting with the rocks, causing alteration of minerals. Uh, clay minerals also have water in their structure. And if we go to the next graphic, we see these clay minerals and, and other hydrated minerals, so minerals with water in the structure, in different geological settings throughout the planet. This is just a, another example that we're able to get at now with this high spatial and spectral resolution of Mars, where we can pick out in, in the walls of this crater, kind of like the, the pages in a book, two different pages in Mars history where, where early in Mars history we had uh, an alteration, that process that formed iron magnesium clays, maybe not so much water flushing through, possibly in the subsurface, but on the top we have this, 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 this unit with a higher degree of leaching forming aluminum, aluminum clay. So two distinct periods in Mars history recorded in these strata. If we go to the next, I'm just going to provide another example because here we go from clay minerals. Clay minerals form from long-term chemical interaction of water with rock. And they're the green color. Now, the, the pink color is, um, are sulfate minerals. Ident again, salt minerals identified through spectroscopy. Now, so this is just a subset, a small snapshot from a, from a, a, a crater that's um, uh, over 100 miles in, in diameter. And what we see when we look around that crater is this bathtub ring of salts. So in this crater, it was once filled with water and upon evaporation deposited these sulfates sort of ringing around afterwards. What does this all mean? So if we go to the next graphic, what we think this means is that we, we can trace a progression in Mars history through both minerals um, and by careful examination of, 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 of rock strata in a few key locations across the planet. Now on the bottom are Noachian, Hesperian, Amazonian, uh, the na their names you'll hear over the course of other press briefings, which are the traditional divisions in Mars time. What we think we see as we move toward from the Noachian is this clay era where there was abundant water chemically interacting with rocks. We move that and then into a drying period where you get sulfate salts deposited as the water begins to go away at the surface. And then you're in cold, modern Mars, where ice is the story, not liquid water. So there's this fundamental transition between the Noachian and the Amazonian, between the area of, era of clays, to the area of sulfates, to the area, era of anhydrous minerals, where water doesn't appear to play a role. And it's that critical period that's spanned by the, by the sediments at Gale Crater. We want to understand those transitions, so that's why we're headed there. Thank you very much. And our next briefer, is John Grossinger, the project scientist for Mars Science Laboratory from the California Institute of Technology. John. Great, thanks, George. Uh, so what I'd like to do is take you back uh, again to a few decades ago, and if we can have the first graphic. Um, one of the reasons, one of the motivating reasons for the Viking mission to land and, and look for evidence of, of life on the surface of Mars was a discovery of the, the channel network systems that you see here. Uh, these have been studied for decades now. I think it's safe to say that, that, that virtually the vast majority of the science community believes that these channels were cut by flowing water, emerging from the surface, subsurface, maybe flowing across the surface. But it's these channel systems that originally attracted so much attention for Mars. Now, in the more recent decade, there have been some spectacular discoveries that sort of fill out the rest of the story. Because if you look at these channels, it's natural to ask if, if water was flowing, where would it take all the materials that were eroded away to, to create the, the canyons? So if you go to the next uh, display item, what we see here is a delta called Eberswald Delta. It was one of the potential landing sites for the mission. And, uh, and it's at the end of one of these channel networks. And so we see all the material that got eroded by water here being deposited in water as a delta that almost everybody can recognize. And, and this is really amazing because in addition to this, there was also the discovery of clay minerals here. So we're beginning to see a more balanced picture of Mars, one where you have source areas 
that represent the interaction of water with rock to produce sedimentary materials that contain alteration products like clays and then they get transported down river systems to form things like deltas that would have accumulated in bodies of standing water and this is very attractive from a habitability point of view and it creates the basis then for Mars Science Laboratory to have had a, a very exciting uh, landing site selection process. So if we go to the next one, now we're going to jump up here more recently within the last uh, seven years, the discoveries by the rover Opportunity in the Mars Exploration Rover mission. And here we see a number of very important aspects that, that take us into our understanding of modern Mars. One is, is that we see layered rock, sedimentary rock, and the sedimentary rock on Mars we view in an analogous way to sedimentary rocks on Earth which are the principal repository for all the uh, the records of, of life on Earth. And while Mars Science Laboratory is not a life detection mission, we are on a mission to to investigate the building blocks of life, important chemical elements, and also potentially look for organic uh, compounds. And when you have uh, what a geologist calls a model like this where you can look at the rocks and see that you had ancient sand dunes, uh, environments where there was ancient groundwater, and then environments where you had ancient streams. This gives you a whole diversity of potentially different habitats. This is just one example on Mars. You can go back to the locations that Bethany was talking about, very ancient Mars, and you see a different type of geological history and a very different type of, of uh, potentially habitable environments. So we're just on the cusp of beginning to come up with a, a whole range of these possibilities for us to explore into the future. Okay, so in the next one, now we take us into, as Bethany mentioned, there were the three eras where you went from dominantly clays, time when weathering alteration of water produced clays, to a time when alteration of water produced a lot of sulfate minerals, to a time when apparently there were not many hydrated minerals that were formed, yet we still see the accumulation of sedimentary materials. And you might ask, what do you learn about Mars in the absence of water or in the absence of a potentially habitable environment uh, for life if it had evolved on Mars? And this is a beautiful example of that. You see these very well organized strata. This is like a heartbeat, except this is the heartbeat of the planet's climate cycle. So just like on Earth we're very interested in, in climate change, on Mars we see this very rhythmic alternation of layers that creates a, a, a really spectacular record of past climate change on Mars. And then that takes us to the era that Bethany talked about first, where Mars is dominated more by ice and a very cold climate and atmospheric processes and transport of sediments by wind rather than water. So we see, we can see in the rock record these, these different histories. Okay, so now if we go to the next one, what we see here is our destination for Mars Science Laboratory. This is Gale Crater. You'll hear uh, a lot about it tomorrow at the press briefing tomorrow. There is a crater uh, about 150 kilometers in diameter. That's about as big as the Los Angeles Basin, surrounded by the mountains that ring the Los Angeles Basin. And right there in the middle of it is a mountain about five kilometers high. That's as high as Mount Whitney, which is the tallest mountain in, in the lower 48 states. And if you go from the yellow dot, which is in the center of our landing ellipse, we have the ability to traverse in our mission through the first uh, few hundred meters uh, of, of strata that you see there. And then eventually, over an extended mission, it might be possible to go to the top of that mound. But the important thing I wanted to say about the mound today, it, it, to sort of lock in some of the points that we've been talking about, at the base of the mound you see strata that are composed of clays and sulfates. As you go farther up the mound, you see strata that are composed of dominantly sulfates. And then as you get above uh, you know, the first 500 meters or so, you then go into strata that don't have hydrated minerals. They seem to be composed of these rhythmites from the drier time of Mars. So in one location, uh, uh, we can drive the rover through all these successive different environments and, and sample these various periods in, in the history of Mars that we've talked about. So I'll turn it back to George. All right. Thanks very much. We're ready now to take questions. So please give your name and affiliation when the microphone comes to you, and we'll start right here in the front with Ken. 